Welcome to the English version of my visual podcast about the history of Ganda Airport. I got the idea after watching a fascinating documentary uh, by the German TV station ZDF. It's on Curiosity Stream, and then I found that somebody had put the German version on YouTube. I wanted to tell the story of Gander in my own words, so I wrote the script first in German and then in English, using a variety of sources. Most pictures in the video are public domain, and some are courtesy of Gander International Airport. One fascinating episode is how an East German couple, on their way back from Cuba, enter the departure lounge in Gander during the refueling stop and never return to the interflug plane or their homeland. So please check out the subtitles in the lower right, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon for notifications. Why was the airport that was once the biggest in the world built in the middle of a wilderness? The answer is actually quite simple. Ganda International Airport is situated on the island of Newfoundland in the northeast of Canada. The airport was built in the 1930s north of Ganda Lake, around 60 kilometers west of the coast, which is often fog bound. There was also a railway line there. The range of the aircraft of that time was insufficient for direct flights between Europe and North America. They had to make an intermediate stop and refuel. Gander and also the Irish airport Shannon became important springboards across the Atlantic. Both airports lie on the route between Northwest Europe and Northeast America, the shortest connection between the two continents. Building work began in June 1936. At that time, Newfoundland was a self-governing British dominion. The town of Gander was built to house the building workers and airport employees. The first aircraft landed on the 11th of January 1938. In November of the same year, operations began. Four paved runways were built, the longest named 0321, with a length of 10,200 feet or 3,109 meters. After it opened, Gander quickly became the biggest airport in the world. In the Second World War, the Gander Station of the Royal Canadian Air Force was of great strategic importance. On the 10th of November 1940, seven American military aircraft departed on a test flight from Gander to Belfast. All seven landed there safely. After that, more than 20,000 fighter planes flew from the USA to Europe, with a refueling stop in Gander. Supplies were brought to Britain and to the European Front. Approximately 20,000 people from the US Air Force lived around the airbase. After the war, the local authorities regained responsibility for the airport, and it wasn't long until civilian aviation started. At that time, flying was risky. The strict safety standards of today did not exist. Despite the risks, more and more people wanted to fly, Soon, the big propeller airliners of BOAC, Pan Am and TWA were making the flight across the Atlantic. At that time, the journey from London to New York could take up to 18 hours. Gander became the hub of commercial aviation. Crossroads of the world was the slogan. In the 1950s, 13,000 aircraft carrying 25,000 passengers landed and took off every year at Gander Airport. The passengers at this time were often privileged people, such as film stars and leading politicians. 
In the boom years, the rich and famous came into the improvised departure lounge where they drank cocktails and were photographed. Clark Gable, Marilyn Monroe, John Wayne, Elizabeth Taylor and Winston Churchill were visitors to Gander. On the 29th of June 1959, a new terminal was opened by the Queen. But the boom years were soon to end. The DC-4s, Stratocruisers and Constellations of the 40s and 50s soon became outmoded. The Boeing 707 revolutionised transatlantic air travel. This jet aircraft had a range of 8,000 kilometres and could cross the Atlantic direct from London to New York in only eight hours. And so traffic at Gander decreased rapidly during the 1960s, but the airport was still important for military purposes. In 1964, Jack James became airport general manager. He didn't just work here, he lived here. The airport was his life, and he devoted himself to the commercial success of Gander. In the late 60s, he targeted the Eastern Bloc countries. Their Tupolovs and Ilyushins used too much fuel for longer flights. They flew regularly back and forth to communist Cuba. Aircraft belonging to Aeroflot and the GDR airline Interflug became regular visitors to Gander. Aeroflot came with around 60 flights per week. The crews were stationed at Gander. The Eastern Bloc Airlines opened offices at the airport or in Gander. Eastern Bloc heads of state, such as Brezhnev and Honecker, were personally welcomed by the airport director. Fidel Castro had his first winter wonderland when, as a guest of the airport management, he rode a toboggan in the snow. Communist rulers were the new VIPs at the airport, but their subjects saw an opportunity to escape. After landing, the passengers always came into the terminal while the plane was being refuelled. The waiting area did not officially belong to Canada, but if a passenger wanted to stay in Canada, it was possible. He or she could go to a member of the security staff and simply say the words, save me. That meant that the person was asking for political asylum. From that moment on, they were accepted by the Canadian authorities. The security police of the communist country they had come from could do nothing. In the documentary film Gander, the Airport in the Middle of Nowhere by Roland Mai, Wolfgang Jörn from Neubuko in the GDR describes how he and his girlfriend of that time flew from Berlin Schönefeld to Cuba. They had, however, already decided that they would not be returning to their socialist fatherland. He describes how, on the return flight, he got off the Interflug plane in Gander and came into the waiting hall. He had brought his bag with him from the aircraft. His girlfriend went to the security guard and said, save me. Thankfully, he and his girlfriend were successful. He still lives near Toronto, and in 2018, he went back to his hometown for the first time in 30 years. When, at the beginning of the 1990s, the end of communism came, the Eastern Bloc Airlines had to close their offices. It was a sad time for colleagues on both sides. The plane is the safest form of transport, we know that. The last major air crash near Gander happened in the 1980s. On the 12th of December 1985, a chartered Douglas DC-8 of the airline Arrow Air made a refuelling stop in Gander. It was bringing US soldiers who had been on a peacekeeping mission in the Sinai to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. After takeoff, the plane got into a stall and crashed. All 256 people on board were killed. Presumed cause, ice on the wings. Two other serious accidents took place near Gander. A Czechoslovak Ilyushin 18 in 1968 and a Sabina DC-4 in 1946. In the 1990s, fewer and fewer international airlines came to Gander Airport. Its future seemed uncertain until, in the northeast of the USA, an unimaginable tragedy caused a crisis. On the 11th of September 2001, after the terrorist attacks, 39 aircraft were diverted to Gander. 6,122 passengers and 473 crew were stranded there and had to wait many hours in their aircraft. 
Then the passengers were welcomed by the 10,000 inhabitants of the town of Ganda. They were treated like members of the family. The guests and their hosts became close friends. When the time came to fly on, many parted with tears in their eyes. In recognition of this, Lufthansa named its new Airbus A340 Ganda Halifax in 2002. Nowadays, not many aircraft land at Ganda, but at a height of 30,000 feet and above, around 1,500 aircraft overfly Newfoundland on a normal day. The control centre of the Canadian Air Traffic Control for Canada and the North Atlantic, NAV Canada, is situated not far from the airport and is an important employer in the area. Ganda Airport today is an airport for small passenger aircraft, private jets, regional airlines, freighters and military aircraft. There's an important flying school here, Ganda Flight Training. It dates back to the year 1992 when its founder, Patrick White, bought a Cessna 150 and began as a flying instructor. Today the school offers a wide range of flying courses. Students come from Canada and abroad to do their pilot training here. With its long tradition in aviation, Gander is a place with a passion for flight. The people here are fascinated by planes and flying. That makes Gander an ideal place for flight training. Newfoundland is a cold and often a wet place with snow, ice and wind. Many people all over the world say, if you've learned to fly here, you can fly anywhere in the world. But Ganda, like its sister airport Shannon, also has an important role as an emergency landing site for aircraft that get into difficulties over the Atlantic. The coronavirus of 2020 brought new challenges for Gander and all other airports. Gander International Airport has seen many highs and lows in the past. Hopefully, as time moves on for this historic and remarkable airport, its future will remain secure. I made that recording of a Boeing 737 standing at the top of the runway here using my Roland Ederol digital audio recorder. I bought it in 2006 and it's still going strong, touch wood. Gander Airport has a fascinating history and I'd like to write about more airports including Shannon, Manchester and the Berlin airports. Nowadays it's not possible to fly direct to Gander. Uh, it would be Air, Air Transat to Toronto and then Air Canada on to Gander, a journey of at least 12 hours. I'd love to go and sit in that departure lounge with its 1950s interior, but I don't think it's going to happen soon. So please like the video, subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon for notifications so you can hear about my next interesting destination.